Thank you for the support and feedback that I've been getting every week. I am glad that these programs continue to help you. Today we're going to talk about something very interesting, as always, things that we dare not talk about, but it's very prevalent. You probably have heard of people who begin to have dementia. What does dementia mean? How does it form? What does it really mean when you lose your memory when you grow old? Does it happen to the old? Does it happen to the young? It's a very interesting topic because our population continues to grow. Before I move on to this topic, I'd like to divert a little bit because this was a very interesting issue for me when I left residency. When I started practicing, I started getting called by nursing homes because I did not understand why there was people with psychiatric problems in the nursing homes. It turns out that a lot of family members would call me asking for help and pleading me. And I could not even imagine, what am I going to do in a nursing home? And when I walked through those doors, I realized what was going on. I saw many family members who were losing their memory, grandparents and mothers and fathers. They were disrobing, they were having very peculiar behaviors of aggression, and they were very, very desperate. By the same token, it was a big challenge because there was this movement of anti-psychiatry. Many people, unfortunately, have a bad image of psychiatry. Movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest provoke horrible images of psychiatry in the years before. You have to remember that psychiatry is still a very young profession. It is a profession of mental illness, impairment of behavior, and all kinds of things we dare not talk about. In the old days, we used to put people, our family used to put people in these huge organizations, such as hospitals, because they could not deal with some of these behaviors of the brain when it became diseased. I'd like to first tell you what dementia is, but for those who have family members, I want you to destigmatize yourself about what it means to have dementia. Psychiatrists, we're not the enemy. We're constantly trying to figure out ways to help you. Unfortunately, we're not often received very welcome because it means the employment of medications. But we have learned so much over the years. We can now treat people with dementia. We cannot cure this disease, but we can make their life comfortable. I'm going to show you and guide you through the steps of what it's like to have dementia. We're going to take a journey into the brain and show you how it begins and then up to the point as to how it could be treated. You know, Dementia is a very horrible disease because you see the person forgetting their lives and they seem to be forgetting you who you are. Some patients do not develop what we call behavioral problems. One of the biggest problems with dementia are the behavioral symptoms and which I will discuss later. The very advanced diseases are the ones that you see people with aggression, disrobing, taking their clothes off, pacing, movements which we call stereotypic movements this is what you see that makes them suffer some of them are yelling and screaming and because they're screaming because the brain is highly impaired those are the people with dementia that are suffering you've probably seen others that are smiling and they don't suffer in your mind you think that they're suffering but in their world they're not suffering because there are different levels of dementia let me give you a historical account of what dementia is and where it came from. So first, let me tell you why this is such an important topic. There is a book written by the World Health Organization. It's called Risk Reduction of Cognitive Decline in Dementia. It's such an important topic that they have to publish guidelines. You have to understand that dementia is a rapidly growing global public health problem. Worldwide, around 50 million people have dementia. That's significant. Approximately 60% of these people live in low and middle income countries. We do not know why, but it does prevail. Every year there are 10 million new cases of dementia. The total number of people with dementia is projected to reach 82 million by 2030 and 152 million in 2050. You can see how this economically can impact the families and how it can impact organizations. It is estimated that in 2050, it cost the world, just the world, $818 billion 
equivalent to 1.1% of the gross domestic product for each country. That's a lot of money. And it's telling you that some of these diseases are so problematic that the amount of places that we require is very important. I will show you in a few minutes why this disease becomes so severe and progresses. As always, I try to show you the world of the brain. You have learned so much and how wonderful this brain of ours is. Come with me and take this journey we're about to take and I will show you how dementia forms. So let's go back in time to a period when this began. Interesting enough, even though there's a stigma with psychiatrists, it was actually a psychiatrist who discovered the disease. He was a psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease began in 1907 where it was discovered by this Aloise Alzheimer. I'm about to show you pictures of his first patient. His name was August D. Try to imagine how devoted this psychiatrist was. He was able to take a microscope and he was able to identify substances that we call neurofibrinary tangles and senile plaques. What is this? Let's continue into the brain and let me show you how this works. And let's look and see how these things happen. Remember that in our brain, there are these wonderful things we call neurons. They communicate among themselves through the synapse. It's such a vital and important thing to have functioning. We're discovering that the disease seems to pre present itself 10 to 15 years before the onset of symptoms. It is a hidden and silent disease. We know that there are two substances that are very important. Senile plaque formed by beta amyloid protein and neurofibrillary tangle formed by something we call tau protein. Let's look inside the cell how these things can cause damage. We know that inside the cell, as you remember, the cell has incredible abilities to protect itself. And we have these things we call APP, they're the police. They're surfacing this, the, the cell to get rid of these substances we call beta amyloid protein. When these APP police proteins work, they dissolve and we live a normal life. But it appears that somehow these APP ability begin to diminish. And these proteins seem to form out of control and they begin to form this plaque that looks like a web. On the other end, there's another thing we call tau protein. This is this foundation of dementia. Inside the cell, what holds the cell together appears to be a skeleton. This skeleton is what we call microtubules. It is held together by something we call tau proteins. It appears that these proteins somehow begin to malfunction and they disappear and it causes the cell to shrivel and die. Now remember, this is happening 15 years before the actual disease. This is why it's so difficult to determine the diagnosis of these patients. So the key is, what if we were to find a way to detect these proteins? Many possibilities can be done. I know that they're trying to develop new technologies to be able to detect these proteins early. The reality is, is how do we stop it? Unfortunately, the development of these proteins cannot be stopped as of now. Many drugs have been tried to be made, but it's been unsuccessful. So you ask me, why is this such an important thing then? Because we have to figure out if we can detect the disease early, we can slow down its progression and give you and buy you more time to live. And as you remember, how do these tangles and how do these proteins impact you? It appears that these proteins accumulate in the cells of your brain inside something we call the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a very structure responsible for memory. But they're discovering that these proteins that we call neurofibrillary tangles also impact the front part of your lobe. The thing is, as the disease progresses, it is very subtle. You begin to forget things. You forget to add calculations. You forget to do simple tasks, and you sometimes even believe that people have stolen your wallet, when in reality you have it in your pocket. It is at this point that you have to at least seek consultation with a neurologist or a psychiatrist. You may not be able to detect the disease early, 
but you'll be able to do certain tests that we call neuropsychological testing. Now, neuropsychological testing is such an important test because you can see if there's a malfunction in your brain. And if you have the hint of suspicion, we can start treating you with certain drugs that we call either Aricet or Mimantine, Danasepil. There are drugs that can slow down the progression. The news can be somber for a lot because the images that you have that the disease can progress. What we don't know though is how can it progress so fast? We do know that certain diseases can make it worse. Like for example, there's another type of dementia we call vascular dementia. You may have Alzheimer's com complicated with vascular. Vascular dementia is the result of not enough vascularization or not enough oxygenation or oxygen in certain parts of your brain. All these things are one, are two of four types of dementia. But my purpose here is not to give you a whole biological background, but to show you that it's a disease that if you can detect early, you can slow it down by taking certain medications. I get called in the nursing homes when the disease already has progressed in very advanced stages. In this phase, they call it the behavioral symptoms and signs of dementia. Some of these things appear as early as two years. It is critical to have good psychiatric care to detect it early because I'm about to show you what symptoms begin to present when you are in a nursing home or your family's in a nursing home and then these symptoms can become worse. Allow me to show you some of these symptoms. Often you have to understand that depression is not part of aging. It is not part of aging. Get that out of your mind right away. Depression is not a disease of the aging. Depression is a disease, and it could be something of much more worse. And the problem is that depression can hide other symptoms and illnesses, such as dementia. One of the things that we begin to see when somebody has dementia, or we suspect, and this is why it's so important to make the choice early. Social withdrawal is one of the first things that we see about three years before. And we have to be very careful if you grow older and you begin to have social withdrawal. Depression could be a manifestation of dementia and this is why it's important for you to seek help right away. Because if you can seek help, you can slow down the disease and have hope. Begin depression is one of the earliest symptoms of dementia. The next thing we see is something we call paranoia, fear. Like somebody is having an affair with your wife. Sometimes you see your grandfather and he will say to you, hey, you're having an affair to his wife when it really nothing is really happening. Another thing that you see with these kind of illnesses, they have a problem with the sleep cycle. They're up at night. How many people have heard? How many of you have heard somebody found in the streets in the middle of the night out of nowhere? They're wandering in the streets or somebody gets lost in the news. You probably heard. How can a geriatric or an older person disappear into the streets because these are maybe the early symptoms of dementia. Things that you begin to see is paranoia and anxiety and accusations. This, at this point, when you begin to have these symptoms I just mentioned, we're at the stage of dementia. And then comes the more severe symptoms. And this is where we can intervene even further. Irritability, mood changes, Often you will find somebody in a nursing home screaming and taking their clothes off. You will find them to be aggressive. In fact, it's a very important thing to keep everybody safe. Usually at this point or before is when they get called also for help. And this is where I tell families, leave your stigma behind. There is help with the right person and the right doctor. You have many supporting staff to help you in the hospital. You have a social worker, you have a nurse, you have allied crew to help you with these decisions. Please be open to this. Normally, we don't intervene until we begin to see these behaviors because some of these behaviors causes problems for other residents. And the last thing you wanna to be told is that you have to take your mother or father or grandfather out of the building because they're very aggressive. Let me give you some hope and let me unhijack your brain that things can be fixed. You just gotta know how to do it. 
The biggest thing that we have to do is you have to give consent and allow permission for an evaluation. Many of these symptoms can be treated and the protocols have changed over the years. When I started back in the year 2001 and even before, we had very few drugs. Now there's many options. We have learned something. The problem is, if you don't have the experience to do this, you will find the person's bending over, sedated. This is not the goal of the management of people with behavioral problems. My goal, at least in my practice that I've seen, is to keep somebody happy, not to hear voices, not to scream, not to take their clothes off. Yes, they can have memory problems, but they could be smiling. And this is where we have to define what success is. In your mind, they don't remember you. But the fact that you're there and you're holding their hand and you're provoking a smile, that is a good quality of life to end this earth. It is not a good quality of life to earn this earth screaming and taking your clothes off just because you have the stigma of not getting help for your family member. And this is why you need to educate yourself. I'm just here to bring to light the things that you can do, the rest you can educate yourself on the internet. There's so much information out there and misinformation. You know, as I was doing this YouTube, I did a little research there's an incredible movement of anti-psychiatry. I am so sorry if my profession has caused this distrust. One of my purposes in my program is to take away that distrust, that we can do something. We're not a perfect profession, but we can provide care for your family. And for my colleagues, pay attention, because you have to redefine what success is. I always tell you, success is improving the quality of life and not necessarily reversing the aging process of dementia. Treatment is available. I'm not going to get into specific medications, but we do have a principle in treatment, at least I do. We always go low and slow. When we intervene in the nursing home, it takes time. There are things that you can do that don't require medication. Simple things that you can do to your families by leaving a light in the corner or having a clock. It is very scary to wake up in the darkness and not know where you are. That's when you begin to scream. We're paying attention that certain diseases also make dementia worse. We already know if you have a urinary tract infection, if you're hungry or thirsty. Very advanced dementia cannot communicate the crying and the screaming. You don't want that and that's treatable. It is manageable. It is a progressive stepwise approach in the management of these patients. You know, growing old, you don't have to suffer. I want to share with you this beautiful poem that was found at the bedside. What do you see, nurses? What do you see? Are you thinking when you're looking at me? A crabby old woman, not very wise, uncertain of habit with faraway eyes, who dribbles her food and makes no reply when you say in a loud voice, I do wish you try, who seems not to notice the things that you do and forever is losing a stocking or shoe, who on resisting or not lets you do as you will with bathing and feeding the long day to fill. Is that what you're thinking? Is that what you see? Then open your eyes, nurse. You're not looking at me. I'll tell you who I am as I sit here so still, as I rise at your bidding, as I eat at your will. I am a small child of ten with a father and mother, brothers and sisters who love one another. A young girl of sixteen with wings on her feet, dreaming that soon now a lover she'll meet. A bride soon at twenty, my heart gives a leap, remembering the vows that I promised to keep. At 25 now, I have young of my own who need me to build a secure, happy home. A woman of 30, my young now grow fast, bound to each other with ties that should last. At 40, my young sons have grown and are gone, but my man's beside me to see that I don't mourn. At 50 once again, more babies play around my bees. 
Again, we know children, my loved one, and me. Dark days are upon me. My husband is dead. I look at the future. I shudder with dread. For my youngs are all rearing, young of their own. And I think of the years and the love that I've known. I'm an old woman now, and nature is cruel. Tis her jest to make old age look like a fool. The body a crumble, grace and vigor depart, that now is a stone where I once had a heart. But beside me this old carcass, a young still girl dwells, and now again my batter heart swells. I remember the joys, I remember the pain. I am loving and living life over again. I think of the years, all too few gone too fast, and I accept the stark fact that nothing can last. So open your eyes, nurse, open and see, not a crabby old woman. Look closer, see me. Thank you once again. I'm glad you have enjoyed today's channel. Always like and subscribe, and I'm looking forward to see you next week. You have a great day. <laughs>